I would like to introduce our Worldview speaker, weighing in at 5'9", 180 pounds, dripping wet, bald head, Joe Rigney. Let's do it. Nine? 5'11. It's 5'11. Just want to make that clear. It's 5'11. I shorted you. And, and 185. All right. Let, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we uh, thank you for your faithfulness to us through the night. Um, we lay down and slept and we woke again because you sustained us. And so this morning we want to come into your presence. We want to ask for your help to understand your word and then to give us grace as we try to apply it in, a, in uh, various ways today. Um, so grant us grace uh, as we kick it off this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> it's good to know that you all will be paying much more careful attention to what you have heard um, in light of the points at stake. So, um, so that's good. Uh, I want to begin uh, by trying to nail down something we saw yesterday. Um, and try to connect it a little bit to some of the things that Dr. Merkel said. So yesterday I was arguing that every good gift in your life is designed by God to lead you to God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The honey declares the glory of God. The maple syrup declares the glory of God. It gives us categories for understanding God's wisdom. And so I want to do one more try at this to see how created things can lead us to God and so this is kind of a review of last night and then a preview of, of this morning, or yesterday and a preview this morning. So here's the text. Psalm 4, verses 7 and 8. Listen carefully. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Now... The they in that passage, their grain and wine, refers to those who love vain words and seek after lies. That's earlier in the, in the psalm. In other words, these are people who reject God and mock his people. Okay, so this is the mockers that, that Dr. Merkel was talking about in, the, in his talks yesterday. And so here's the, here's the point. You put more joy in my heart than they have uh, when their grain and wine abound. Um, God is better than worldly parties. That's the point. God is better than worldly parties. Worldly parties with trivial people can give you some joy. They are enjoyable up to a point, but the joy of the Lord is better than any worldly party. But then the question is, what about a godly party? Okay, what about laughter and fun and joy and competitions with friends at the called conference? And what I want you to hear from me is God is better than the godly party too, but we need to make a distinction. Okay? With, with the worldly party, we're called to turn away from the worldliness, from the drunkenness, the debauchery, the disobedience, the mocking. We turn away from all of that when we turn to God. But with the godly party, we're called to enjoy it to the hilt, to laugh hard and loud and long, to delight in our friends and to receive the gift that God is giving us with gratitude. And then in the midst of that deep, godly joy, we say, God's like this. And God is better than this. God is like this and God is better than this. He's like this because upright and godly fellowship is a picture of fellowship with God. The good things that we love about our friends, their kindness, their wisdom, their humor, their creativity, their loyalty, are all echoes of God's attributes. But we also say he's better than this because he's the all-satisfying creator of the universe. He has every perfection and he has them infinitely. He is the joy of every joy. And so we can't be content to simply have fellowship with other creatures who reflect him we want to chase the joy back to God. So we, could, we, did that, we can do that with, with the godly party. We could also do it in that verse with sleep. And some of you guys, by the end of the week, will be wishing for more of that. How does sleep help me love Jesus more? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practice that. I'm going to apply that later. All right, so now what we're going to do is turn to Genesis 2. So you've got your Bible. You can pull it open. Here's the situation at the end of Genesis 2. I know we haven't had a chance to walk through everything, so I'm going to summarize a bit of it. And tomorrow we're going to talk about some of the things as well. 
Um, here's the situation at the end of Genesis 2. We see uh, man, Adam and Eve, in God's world, in the land of Eden, in a beautiful garden with a river running down to water it. And so if you picture this in your head, the, the picture we get in Genesis 2 is like um, there's like a mountain and from the top of the mountain, there's like a spring of some kind. And then kind of as you come and come down the mountain, so think like not just like a really tall peak, but probably like a long sloping thing. As you come down, there's a, uh, there's a garden. That's where God plants the garden uh, below the fountain. And then it flows down to the fountain. And then after it hits the garden, um, it splits and it becomes four rivers, which then run all over our nation. And it, th- those four rivers flow out and they flow out into the rich the fertile and the unsubdued earth. We talked about that on Monday. So in other words, what we see at the end of Genesis 2 is this. We see God's man in God's land, under God's law, on God's mission. God's man in God's land, under God's law, on God's mission. And, and what I want you to hear in that is a, is a summary of, of a pattern that will show up again and again in the Bible. You can go to just about any place in the Bible and you can find that. You can find God's man, or later it's going to be God's people, in God's land, under God's law, on God's mission. Because that's a fundamental theme in the Scriptures and it's established right here in Genesis chapter 2. God places Adam in the garden, gives him a mission, work and keep it. We saw the first night, those two words are often used in the Bible to describe priests. The garden is a sanctuary, a holy place, and Adam is tasked with being a servant in God's house, a priest who guards the sacred space. So we didn't get into this much, but the va- basic task of the, when, when those words show up in numbers for the Levites, um, it's here, here, Levites, here's a sword. If anything co- unclean gets anywhere near to this tabernacle, you have the authority to put them to death. That's, that's what a priest did. So often, and this, and this is confusing to us, because often in the modern world, we think of priests fundamentally like a pastor, or we associate it maybe like with Roman Catholicism, since they call their pastors priests. And so we have this very particular notion of what a priest is. In the Bible, the priests are people with swords, and they have swords because if anybody gets too close to where God is... They have to put them to death because if they don't, if something unclean enters in there, God is going to break out of there and it will not be good for anybody. So priests uh, are tasked with being servants, guardians of sacred space. Then we also saw a man's a king, expanding sacred space, making the world like the garden. He's a son over God's house. He should subdue the earth. And finally, he's to name the world as he goes, joining God and drawing out and expressing the meaning of God's works. In order to accomplish that mission, God gives Adam a helper, a perfect companion, fellow bearer of God's image. He is her head. She is his helper to accomplish the mission of God. And God is meeting their relational needs and their physical needs. He is lavishing them with beautiful trees, tasty fruit. They have strength to accomplish the mission. Every tree is theirs for food except for one. There is one no in this world of yes. That's the end of Genesis 2. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do this morning is we want to talk about temptation, and we want to talk about sin, and we want to talk about gospel. And I want to do it all from Genesis 3. So temptation, sin, and gospel, all from Genesis 3. So let's begin with temptation. Genesis 1, there came a serpent, right, a crafty serpent, and he tempts and tests Adam and Eve. Now remember, God had said to them, you may surely eat from every tree except one. Notice what Satan does when he asks the question. Pay very, very careful attention to his first question. He says, did God really say that you may not eat from any of the trees in the garden? Now, just stop first. This is Bible study. You stop and think about that for a second, what that question means. So God had said, you may eat from every tree except for one, and Satan comes and he says, Did God say you can't eat from any of these trees? You see what he just did? He took the one prohibition, the one no in a world of yes, and he made it into a world of no. You got that? Satan, when he comes to tempt, takes the one no in the world of yes, and he turns it into a world of no. 
He takes the one prohibition and makes it a total prohibition. He takes a true thing, a true feature of the world. Like, is there a no in the world? Is there a no in the world? Yes, no, yeah. You're like, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. Yes, yes, there is a no in the world. There is one of them. And Satan takes that one no and he magnifies it. He blows it entirely out of proportion in his question to Eve. He turns the good giver, that's what God is. He's a good father. He loves to give good gifts. You may surely eat from every tree. He's a good giver. And Satan turns him into the great forbidder. He turns the good giver into the great forbidder. And that's how temptation works. Okay? At root, here's what temptation does. Temptation exaggerates true things about God's world and minimizes or denies true things about God's world. So it exaggerates and it denies. Um, later when, so Eve responds to the question and she says, um, no, God said um, we, can't, we can eat from any tree except for that one, um, nor can we touch it lest, we, lest you die. And there's a question about this. I, I actually I don't have a strong opinion about whether or not her repetition, when she says we shouldn't touch it, is that bad that they put like an extra layer of protection around it? Like, so we can't eat from it. And so they were like, let's just not touch it at all. Like, was that a wise thing? Was that like wisdom? Or was that kind of like Phariseeism? Like, we're going to make up our own laws, right? As a question about that. Where did that idea come from? Did Eve make it up or did Adam tell her that? Like, there's all kinds of questions about that addition. But she gets, at least gets the part right where she says, God said we could eat from everything except for one. But we'll die if we eat from that one. And then notice what, what the, the serpent does next. Whereas the first time he said he took a true thing and he made it bigger, what does he do the second time? What's he, what's he do? When she says we can eat from any tree except that one, if we eat it, we'll die, what, is the, what does the serpent say? Call it out. You will not die. What did he just do? He shrunk, like where, first he took a true thing and he made it really big. Now he took a true thing and he made it invisible. Okay, he took a true thing and he said, no, that's not true. You won't die. You won't die. He just denies it. That's what temptation does. Temptation, using true things about reality, creates a false reality, a fantasy world, and invites us to live in it. That's what the devil does. The devil comes to Adam and Eve, to Eve, and he says, Eve, is this the world, this world of no? Is, is God miserly? Is he a great forbidder? Is he trying to hold you back? Is this the world, Eve? And she says, oh, no, no, God, God gave us every tree. We just can't eat from that one or we'll die. No, Eve, this is the world. You won't die. And he invites her, come, Eve, live in this world. Live in the world that I'm speaking, that I'm inventing. Live in my imaginary world where you won't die if you eat from that tree. Instead, if you eat from that tree, you'll become like God. Don't you want to be like God? Eve? Don't you want to be like God? Knowing good and evil, your, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. And she, and, and there's truth there. Like when she eats the fruit, her eyes are opened. She knows good and evil. She realizes that she's naked, right? Like there's truth. He's telling partial truth, but he's embedding his lie in the partial truth, which is what makes it feel so compelling. And this is how temptation works. I want you to keep this in mind. I want you to keep this, this way of thinking about temptation as creating a false reality, a fantasy world that invites us to live in it. I want you to keep that in mind tomorrow when we talk about film and writing. Because if you want to think about what film and writing is, it's either, we talk about faithful naming, it's either going to be creating a mini world, a sub-creation that's reflecting God's world and says, people, come live in this, this fantasy world. Come live in Narnia for a bit and see if it doesn't change you and make you want to know the truth more. Come live in Middle Earth. C come live in these fantasy worlds that we've invented and, and they'll help you know God better. Or you can say, come live in the fantasy world and let's see if we can numb you to disobedience. That we can, this is what uh, Dr. Merkel was talking about yesterday, when you make friends with the world and they start to kind of deaden your soul to where sin looks good, obedience looks hard, and you begin to scoff until you become a fool. All right. So by hiding the lie within the truth, the lie becomes more believable. 
This is how temptation always works. Eve buys it. She looks at that forbidden tree. She looks at that one no in the world of yes, and she believes the lie. She believes God is withholding something good from me. And that if I trust and obey him, I'm going to miss out on something that is really, really good and really wise and really delightful. So what does she do? She crosses the one line that God has drawn. She seizes what God has forbidden, and that's what sin is. So we've talked about temptation. Here's now what sin is. Sin is pursuing a good thing in ways or at times or in degrees that God has forbidden. It's pursuing a good thing. Like, I've, I've said, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's a good thing. What's the problem? She pursued it in the wrong time in the wrong way. She didn't wait for God to give it to her. She said, I'm going to take it for myself. And if you think about all of the sins in your life, okay, almost all of them are going to have embedded within them a good thing. There's a real good in there. There's something that God meant for your good. And, and what's happening is you're taking it in times or in ways or in degrees that God has said no. Like we saw the other night, knowledge of good and evil isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. God has it. Angels have it. Kings have it. And it's forbidden temporarily until they learn to fear the Lord. But Eve can't wait. She believes the lies of the serpent, and she seizes the fruit on her own terms. She asserts her own autonomy. I will decide when it's right to receive this fruit. And Adam joins her in this rebellion, and together they plunge the human race into sin and death and destruction. That's temptation, that's sin. I want to talk a little bit about idolatry, about how we connect this to what we saw yesterday. Ever since then, ever since this moment, what do we as human beings do with God's good gifts? What do we do with them? We turn them into God's. Ever since the fall, we turn the good gifts of God into gods. We refuse to honor God as God, and instead we seek our deepest satisfaction in created things. We set our hope in them. We prefer them over him. It's like we say, God gives us the gift, and it's like we we look at it, we weigh him in the scales. We say, if I have to choose between God or his gifts, which one do I want? We say, I'll take the gifts. See you later. I'm done. I don't need you. I'll take the stuff. We'll see if that happens. And the biblical term for this is what? What's the biblical term for setting a created thing in the scales with God and preferring the created thing? What's the term for that? Idolatry. That's right. That's idolatry. And then because we've insisted on our own way, because we've seized control, we refuse to say thank you to God for the gifts that remain, and that's called ingratitude. And all of this, of course, is coming from Romans chapter 1. If you want to go look it up and see more In detail, it's Roman chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. I'll read it to you. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Talked about that a little bit yesterday. They're pushing it down. They, They don't want to know what they know. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, His eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. That's yesterday's talk, right? In the things that have been made, you can see the invisible attributes of God. Made things make invisible attributes visible. But we don't want to see God in the made things, and so we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So they are without excuse. Listen. For although they knew God, They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Idolatry, ingratitude, fundamental human sins. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they, listen, this is really important. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. It's a dark exchange. They said, God said, you can have the glory of God. I will give you my glory and I will glorify. You can have my glory. And what Adam and Eve said when they listened to the serpent's lies was, we would rather exchange your glory for this created thing, 
for the fruit of that tree. That's what I'd rather have. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged, there it is again, the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. Now, the tragic irony in Romans 1 there, the tragic irony in all of this is that idolatry, when we refuse to honor God as God, but we exchanged his glory for created things, it ruins the gifts that we turn into gods. Like, you get that? Like, you think, I could have God or I could have this thing. I'd rather have this thing. And you think, I'm going to get to keep the thing. But the thing, the thing is, when you cut God off from it, the thing dies. It rots. And so not only do you not get God, who's the all-satisfying creator of the universe, you don't even get the thing. We think that our joy will be increased if we cross the boundary. That's what Eve thought. If I cross the boundary, I will have more joy than if I stay on this side, if I stay inside the bounds that God has established. If I ignore the rules, if I seize what's been forbidden, but when we cut off that good thing from the source of its goodness, from the God who gave it to us for his purposes, the fruit rots. The gift withers, the joy dies. By putting the lower thing, the created thing, higher than God, we don't just lose God, as bad as that is, we also lose the lower thing. C.S. Lewis put it this way. If you put first things first, you get second things thrown in. If you put second things first, you lose both first and second things. Put first things first, you get them both. Put second things first, you lose them both. That's the way the world works. That's what the thou shalt nots in the Bible are for. We talked about this already. I'm going to reiterate it because it's so important. This is a big deal for you guys as high school students. We are so tempted to think that the no's and the thou shalt nots of the Bible are designed to hamper and kill our joy, but they're not. They're designed to serve our joy. In the same way that walls around a garden allow the fruit to grow and walls around cities in the ancient world made life possible inside. In God's world, walls exist so that good things can run wild. Walls exist. God puts boundaries in place so that inside the boundaries, there can be life and joy and light. God has given the gifts for our enjoyment, for his mission, so that we might know him in and through them. And because he designed them for our good, he knows their proper place, their proper use. And he has given us instruction about those in the scriptures. And so we want God to be the sun at the center of our solar system. And we want all of the good things in our lives, earthly pleasures, friends, family, sports, education, all of the wealth, all of the good things in our lives need to orbit around the sun, which is God. If that happens, everything works. If you remove God, all of those planets will collide with one another and it will be a massive train wreck to mix a metaphor or four. In him, all of the gifts are light. Apart from him, they grow dry and dull and empty. And that's the choice that will confront every one of you for the rest of your life. Will you put God at the center? Will you put him first? Will you make him the supreme object of your desires and affections so that all of your other desires orbit around him? Or will you believe the lie? Will you try to live in the fantasy world of your own creating? Will you exchange his glory for the glory of created things? Will you seize good things on your terms, your terms, instead of enjoying them within the boundaries set by God? That's the choice, and every one of us fails. We all make the same evil choice that Adam and Eve did. And so before we move to the second section, I just want to summarize this one, okay? We've got, we have three definitions that I've given you, okay? And I want you to make sure you get them. I'm willing to bet that they might be on a quiz at some point. Temptation is a mixture of truth and lies that invites us to live in a monstrous fantasy. A mixture of truth and lies that invites us to live in a monstrous 
fantasy seduces us to live in a monstrous fantasy. That's temptation. Sin is seizing a good thing on our own terms at times or in ways or in degrees that God has forbidden. Seizing a good thing on our own terms at times or in ways or in degrees that God has forbidden. And idolatry is failing to honor God as the supreme object of our desires by exchanging him for lesser things. Failing to honor God as the supreme object of our desires by exchanging him for lesser things. Those are the three definitions. If you didn't get all of them, hopefully collectively between your teams, you can keep track. Now, what I want to do for the last little bit here is I want to look at our response to sin and then look at God's response to sin. Okay, so that's the rest of Genesis 3. We looked at the temptation sin part. Now I want to look at the response, okay? What are the consequences that happen of believing these lies, seizing these good things on our own terms, refusing to honor God and worship God as the supreme object of our desire? What happens? What do we do? What does God do? So here's our response. So verse 7 of chapter 3, after they eat, their eyes are opened. They see that they are naked and they are ashamed. Now, it's worth reflecting for a minute on the, the fact of their nakedness. We haven't talked about this yet, okay? Earlier in Genesis 2.25, we read, Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. They were naked and unashamed. And we read that and we rightly say it's because they were innocent. They hadn't sinned yet, so their nakedness wasn't this shameful thing, and so they were innocent, and that's why they're naked and unashamed. They have no sin, therefore they can have no shame, okay? That's true. Because one of the functions of clothing in the Bible is to cover shame. That's, it's, we, we cover shame by clothing ourselves, covering ourselves. But here's the thing. In the Bible, clothing is not only about covering shame. It's also about giving glory and authority. I want you to think about a couple of stories. Probably you're familiar with these. Not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like the lilies of the field. Solomon in his glory wasn't at clothed, there's the language, the clothed as the lilies of the field. Or what about when Joseph in Genesis is elevated to the right hand of Pharaoh in Egypt? Do you remember what he, he's given? He's given a new royal robe of authority. That's, that's the signature, this is my right hand. And so the Pharaoh puts a new robe. What does the robe symbolize, signify? This is the authority. Joseph is now, has all of my authority behind him. Same thing with Daniel in Babylon. When he gets elevated, he's given a new robe. The gift of new clothes in the Bible regularly signifies new authority, investiture. This one is in charge. It's what the high priest's clothing is all about. It's what royal robes are all about. You remember the prodigal son? Okay, the prodigal son has both elements in it, okay? Both functions of clothing show up in the prodigal son. When he comes home, his father puts on him the best robe. Why? First, to cover his filthy rags and his shame, but also to communicate, this son is still my heir. He will share my inheritance. So, here's the, here's the point of that. Like the prohibition on the tree of wisdom, Adam and Eve's nakedness shows both their innocence and their immaturity. Okay? Why are they naked? Because they're children. Not biologically speaking, like they were adults, but in, spiritually speaking, they're still children, and their innocence, in their innocence, they're naked and unashamed. But I don't believe that had they not sinned, we would all be naked today. I believe that had they passed the test, God had a plan, and that plan included clothing. He was going to give them the royal robes of kingship and the royal wisdom to rule well. Does that make sense? Okay? And here's one of the, here's one of the interesting things. This is like a little fun, fun Bible thing. This will hope maybe get you guys, some of you guys excited about uh, studying biblical languages. In Hebrew, um, there are two Hebrew consonants that are silent. Okay? The first letter, Aleph, you've probably heard Aleph. And ayin, okay? 
Neither one of them are pronounced, okay? Um, the Hebrew word for um, animal skins, which shows up later in this passage, is the word or, okay? When God closed them after the sin, he closed them with or. Do you know what the Hebrew word for light is? Or, but with the other letter. One of them is ayin resh, and the other one is aleph resh, but they're pronounced very similarly. And so there's kind of a pun happening. Scholars think there's a pun happening, so that when God comes and he says, I'm going to clothe you with or, meaning animal skins, you're meant to hear in the back of your mind, this could have looked very differently. He could have been coming to clothe them, not with or, but with or. Got that? He was going to clothe them not with animal skins, but with light and glory. All right. So, um, just like toddlers, Adam and Eve are naked and unashamed. Just as God intends for them to eventually eat from that tree, I suspect at some time their eyes would have been opened. They would have seen their nakedness. God would have been there to clothe them with glory and honor. Instead, they seize the fruit on their own terms. They see their nakedness and notice they try to clothe themselves. They sow leaves together. They try to hide among the trees. And here's our first response to sin. We try to hide and cover it up. This is one of the places where uh, I love Genesis 1 to 4 because it reads me. I don't read it. It reads me. Because what happens when I sin? What do I want to do? That. We think that camouflage can keep God from seeing us. Like right now, there are probably some of you in here that are covered in fig leaves hiding among the trees, hoping that God doesn't see you. You're hiding from other people, you're hiding from God, but you cannot hide from him. Like right now, he sees it. Whatever, when I said some of you are hiding, some of you immediately had this horrifying thought in your head, you just popped in, you were like, he's talking about me. And you thought, I hope nobody knows that he's talking about me. And I'm just saying, God knows that I'm talking about you. He sees all of that. All of us are naked and exposed before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account, Hebrews chapter 4. So here's the deal. Don't hide. Don't hide. Your brokenness, your sin, your shame, all of it is undoubtedly real. But shame is not the end of this story. We'll come back to that in a minute. That's the first response. What's the, what the first thing we do? We hide. Second response is blame and accusation. Actually, before that, um, I just got to do this. Um, it's my opportunity to give my youth group, my Baptist youth group leader joke. And I never want to miss an opportunity to do that. So here's the joke. Pastor um, notices that one of his parishioners has stopped coming to church. It's backsliding. Boo, bad. And so he decides to pay him a visit. So he goes to the guy's house, and he rings the doorbell. And nobody answers. He says, I think he's home. So he rings the doorbell again, and then he looks over to the window, and he sees it kind of flutter like someone was looking, and then did that. And he goes, ah, he sees that it's me. And so he's not, he's not going to answer the door. That's okay. And so he pulls out a card, and he, sa- and he, and he, and he writes on it, Hebrews 6.4. It's impossible to, distor- to restore to repentance those who have once fallen away, that passage. And he, and he, puts, he puts his card, business card, and he, and he slides it into the mail slot and says, that'll, that'll tell him. And then he, he goes away. The next Sunday, the guy's there in church. And the pastor says, it worked. It worked. I'm such a good pastor. And afterward, the guy, the guy walks up and he says, uh, oh, good to see you, pastor. It's good to see you too, Bill. And, and, he, and then the guy hands him the card back. And he goes, what's this? He said, I just thought you wanted that back. And he looks at it. And it's Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. I'll wait. That's a good one, right? All right. You're welcome. You know, that's, that's all they're going to remember from this talk, right? Okay. All right, so first response, back in, all right. Re, re, regain control. The first response is we hide and we cover it up. The second response is blame and accusation. God calls to Adam and he says, where are you? And Adam says he was afraid because he was naked, so he hid. 
And like a child caught in his disobedience, notice his explanation for hiding gives away the game. So think about this. You know, like when you're when your child, uh, your child, and your parents confront you, and you try to give an excuse, but in giving the excuse, you actually give yourself up. Um, you know, like um, what happened to my vase? Uh, I didn't break it. How did you know it was broken? Uh, you know, like it's one of those moments. So Adam says, um, "I heard the sound of the garden, and I was I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid." And God goes. How'd you know you were naked? And Adam goes, I knew it. Got to come up with a better excuse. Needed more time. Um, who told you were naked? And then notice what Adam does. He says, the woman you gave me. Okay, now he, I just want you to think about this. There are literally three people in existence. Okay, the serpent notwithstanding, okay? Like there's God and there's Adam and there's Eve. And God comes to Adam and catches him with his hand in the cookie jar, catches him in disobedience. And Adam says, this whole thing is everybody's fault but mine. Okay? Like, the, it was her fault, and you know where she came from, right? The woman you gave me. It's everybody's fault except Adam. So then God turns to Eve and says, what, what have you done? And Eve says, what he said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Both of Eve follows Adam in the blame game. First response is we hide. Second, uh, second response is we blame and accuse. And I want you to think about blame. The command was, don't eat. Both of them say, I ate. Okay, so the command was, don't eat. Both of them say, I ate. But both of them try to justify their action by deflecting the blame. I ate, but it was her fault and yours. I ate, but it was the serpent's fault. That's what we do. We sin, we cover it up, and we hide, and when we're caught, we may admit it. We may say, okay, you got me, I admit it, I admit it. But it wasn't really my fault. It was somebody else's fault. We blame something or someone else as a way of getting off the hook. We make excuses. We rationalize our actions, okay? And, and the rationalizations only ever really apply to our actions. So think about this. When it comes to the sins of other people against you, most of us are merciless, right? Like other people, when they sin against us, it's because they're really, really wicked. But when we sin, we have reasons, right? They sin because they're wicked. We sin because we have reasons. We have rationales. There were extenuating circumstances. There were justifications. But I want you to notice a little bit of a sequence here, okay? I want you to th think about three stages of, Ad of Adam's sin. Adam was called by God to guard the garden, right? Protect the sacred space, Serpent comes, lies to his wife, blasphemes his God, and the entire time Adam is standing there silently. He's passive. He's passive. He just stands there, watches it happen. We know he's there because in verse 7 it says, she gave some to her husband who was with her. Like, he's been there for this whole thing. He stands there and watches it happen. Um, he's with her the whole time. He does nothing. He could have picked up the sword and killed the dragon. He could, have, he could have actually fought the serpent. He could have said, shut up, stop talking to my wife, stop lying. But he doesn't. I had a friend one time in a sermon say, those who fall into great sin never fall far. Think about it. Those who fall into great sin never fall far. Why? What he meant was that prior to the great sin, the big sin, there's almost always this kind of gradual drift, small compromises that numb our consciences, failures to act, weak resistance that we justify, oh, I, I could have stopped it, but I didn't really, so there's blame shifting. And so the first stage here is passivity. Adam just kind of lets it happen. Second stage. After Eve eats, she offers some to him. And now Adam is faced with a choice. Okay, I want you to think about his choice. Paul makes a big deal about this in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We may talk about this tomorrow. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, Eve was deceived, not Adam. Okay, so Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. Because here's the deal. Eve was not created when God told Adam not to eat from the tree. Like, she hadn't been made yet. So how does she know not to eat from the tree? Well, Adam had to teach her, okay? So Eve 
is list, has two authorities in her head. One is her husband who said, God told me to tell you, don't eat from that tree. And the other is the serpent saying, you will not surely die. And she's got to choose between authorities there, and she gets tricked because she didn't hear it from God's mouth. She's, she's, there's ambig- she's got a, a step removed, so she's tricked into, into eating the fruit. Adam, on the other hand, is not tricked. He heard God directly say, if you eat this, you will die. And so he's sitting there watching her having eaten it, and he's faced with a very different choice than she is. He knows the serpent is lying. And so when he sins, it's high-handed sin. It's treasonous sin. His sin is high-handed. In this moment, here's, what, here's Adam's choice. He has to choose between his God and his wife. Between bone of his bones and the one who made his bones. And he chooses her. He exchanges the glory of the immortal God for a creature. That's what, and that's what God says when he punishes Adam. We'll talk about this tomorrow too. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat. In other words, you listened to her and not me. Like you, you chose her over me. You listened to a creature and not your maker. You loved her and you wanted her more than you loved and wanted me. That stage two. First was passivity, second's idolatry. That's where drifting always leads. Eventually, after you drift for a while, you're faced with the big decision. If you've been drifting, if you've been silencing your conscience, if you've been quenching the spirit, when that moment of choice comes, you'll see sin with a high hand. Stage three, passivity, idolatry, and now abuse. Abuse. I want you to think about this one, okay? I want you to think about what Adam blaming his wife means, okay? So, pop quiz. What is the consequence for eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? death. So when Adam says, the woman you gave me did this, he is effectively saying to God, kill her, not me. You got me? Like he's supposed to protect her. And he chose her over God in that moment. I want her more than I want anything else. And now when that God shows up and says, whose fault is this? Adam says, kill her, not me. He exposes her to judgment. He's supposed to die for her. Instead, she tries, he tries to force her to die for him. Passivity, failure to answer God's call to protect and provide. Idolatry, choosing the gift over the giver. Abuse. Ditching the gift to save your own skin. That sequence, that sequence shows up a lot in our lives. And I could, if we had time, I'd take you to Exodus. Talk it's about patterns that show up again and again in the Bible. Go to Exodus and think about the golden calf incident and Aaron. You remember that story? Remember the story? Aaron, like the, Moses up on the mountain. We don't know where he went. Make us a, we would like you to make us a god. And Aaron's like, uh, give me all your gold. Okay, give it gold. And then they burn it, melt it down, form it into a calf, start dancing around, singing, doing all kinds of debauchery around this golden calf, imitating the idolatry they'd seen in Egypt, right? These are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. Um, and so they're, they're dancing around, and then Mo- and the God's like, Moses, you know what they're doing down there? Moses goes down, breaks the tablets, and he's like, what are you doing, Aaron? And Aaron's like, uh, the people... They made me, and so we took the gold, and I threw it in the fire, out popped a calf. That's all I know. (laughs) It's literally textbook what Adam does, right? It's passivity. The people say, do this, and he's like, I guess I'll do it. Then it's idolatry. They're literally bowing down to a statue. And then when it's time to face judgment, and God shows shows up through his prophet Moses and says, what are you doing? Aaron goes, their fault, not mine. I don't know. Don't ask me. This shows up again. Again and again. And it ought to sound familiar to all of us. Okay. Last thing. God's response to sin. 
God responds first by cursing the ground. So I want you to read this. We're going to talk more about the, the woman and the man tomorrow. So I just want to focus on one bit tomorrow. Um, curse on the serpent. God says to the serpent, verse 14, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay. Um, it's important that this comes first in the story because it shapes how Adam and Eve are to hear the curse on their on themselves, okay? The serpent is cursed to eat dust, okay, to eat dust. When man dies, what, is, what does God say? Look down in verse, uh, what is that, 19? What does he say? Say it loud. Dust you are, dust you shall return. So serpent, you're going to be cursed to eat dust. Adam, you're going to become dust, okay? What's the conclusion? The serpent is going to eat you. You got that? The serpent's going to eat dust. You're going to become dust. The serpent's going to eat you, okay? This begins to make sense of passages like your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion seeking someone to devour. In fact, I want you to think about three different ways that the Bible talks about the devil, okay? First, he's a serpent. That's what is in this passage. He's a serpent who seduces, okay? He's the tempter. He lures you into sin with lying fantasies and half-truths, okay? So first, he's a serpent. He seduces you, okay? Second, once you fall into sin, what does the devil do? What does he become? An accuser. That's what Satan, the word Satan literally means. It's an accuser, okay? So first, he's like, you won't die. Come on in here. That's great. Water's fine. Come live here. And then once you do, he's like, how could you have done that? And he's your accuser. He's the one who's going to go before God and say, I've got an accusation against that person. He never lets you forget what you've done. He condemns and accuses you in your own mind and before the throne of God. And then finally, in the end, he's the dragon who devours. He's the serpent who seduces. He's the accuser who condemns. He's the dragon who devours. You return to dust, and the serpent eats the dust. We are dragon food. And if that was the whole story, this would be an epic tragedy. Man's first disobedience brought death into the world and all of our woe. Broken relationships, painful labor, labor devoured by a dragon. But that's not even the ultimate judgment here in this passage. The ultimate judgment from God in the passage is exile from God's presence. God, like broken relationships are bad. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Painful labor is bad. We'll talk about that tomorrow. War with the serpent. We're going to talk about that in a minute. All of these are awful. The worst consequence for man's rebellion is that God forces him at sword point out of the garden. Like the cherubim have swords and are like, you have to go or we're going to use this on you. And in fact, if you think about that, what does that sound like? We said this earlier, remember? The priests. Adam was supposed to be the priest protecting sacred space. Now the sacred space needs protecting from Adam. And so God says, angels, cherubim, you have a sword. It's flaming. If they try to get back in here, use it. Use it. And this is a mercy. This is, this is painful judgment. It's also a mercy. God refuses to let them live in paradise, live forever in their sin, in their shame. But the loss is real. We lost God. Like, we lost God. But here's the final thing. In the midst of judging sin, God mingles mercy. So I just want you to see three elements of mercy in the passage, and then we're done for today. Number one, war with the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. This is mercy. We may be food for the serpent, but we're not going down without a fight. There's a war, and we can resist. And so the war between the two seeds opens up the possibility for us to choose sides, right? You, this opens for us to, to a, a way to renounce Satan and all his works and all his ways. That's the baptismal formula we use at our church. 
God doesn't abandon us to be dragon food. Instead, he starts a war. And the question now is, which side are we on? Are you going to be the seed of the woman, or will you be a brood of vipers? That's mercy number one. Mercy number two, the skull crusher. While this war encompasses all of Adam and Eve's descendants, there will be one of those descendants, notice very carefully, this is really important to Paul, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He, it's singular, he shall bruise your head. One of these offspring, a male offspring, will crush the serpent's head at great cost to himself, his bruised heel. And now the question becomes, who is this seed of the woman who's going to crush the serpent's head? Who's, who's going to give us relief from all of this curse? Who is going to put the world to rights? And the rest of your Bible is answering that question. The entire Old Testament is devoted to, where's the dude that's going to crush the serpent? That's, what every, that's why every baby that's born is such a big deal. Because they're like, is this him? Is this him? Is he coming now? When's he going to get here? This is where we have to talk about Jesus, right? Because the first Adam failed, but the last Adam succeeded. Adam fails in the garden. He seizes the good thing before the proper time. He commits high-handed treason. He exchanges the glory of God for a creative thing. And every son of Adam and every daughter of Eve has followed him into that sin. But Jesus faces his own temptation, not in a garden, but in a wilderness. So we, we, we had ours in a perfect garden. Jesus has his temptation in the wilderness. Satan tells him to turn stones into bread, and Jesus eats the word of God. Satan tempts him to test God's protection. Throw yourself down. He'll catch you. And Jesus says, I'm not putting God to the test. Satan offers the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory to Jesus if he will bow. And Jesus says, oh, I I'm going to get the kingdoms of the world, but I'm not going to get them as a gift from the devil. I'm going to get them by crushing the devil. Not only does Jesus stand against the devil's lies, he succeeds in another way. You remember what I said a second ago? When Adam sinned, he tried to blame his wife to save his own skin, kill her, let her die in my place, God. Jesus comes to a sinful bride, and he says, let me die in her place. Kill me instead. Adam loves himself. Christ loves us and gives himself for us. He takes the punishment for our sins. That's the second thing. War with the serpent, skull crusher. Finally, there's a third element of mercy in the passage, Adam and Eve's new clothes. In 321, Yahweh himself replaces their fig leaves. He kills animals and he clothes them with their skins. And this, so sin requires a covering, it, covering requires death. Somebody's got to die. Somebody's got to die. Blood must be shed if sin is to be dealt with. And these animal skins are a picture and symbol of the true covering that we need because the blood of animals isn't enough. There must be a perfect sacrifice. That's why Jesus comes. The eternal Son of God becomes human so that he could live a perfect life, resist the devil, show us what it means to be human, and not only that, he became human so that he could die. Because he's God, it's an infinite sacrifice. Because he's man, he can actually die for us. And God raised him from the dead to show that sacrifice was accepted, the debt was paid, the serpent is crushed, sin can be covered, forgiven, washed away. He's making all things new. So, God's lavished you with gifts to lead you back to him. He is the God of yes. He has filled the world with pleasures to show you what he's like and draw you into his presence. But you've rejected him. You've tried to create your own fantasy world to live in. You've turned his gifts into gods. You've exchanged him for them. You've seized good things on your own terms and in your own ways. And so you're hiding. You're covering yourself with fig leaves. You're blaming others for your problems. Your relationships are a mess. Your dreams are empty. You're cut off from God's presence. You've made yourself his enemy. But God doesn't leave you there. He sends Jesus, the true Adam, to pass the test for you, to humble himself, take the form of a servant, 
die on the cross, take your place, cover your sins, give you hope. And that's why we trust it. Let's pray. Father, I know that this, this story is not unfamiliar to these students. They've probably heard it a lot. But may it never get old to us. May it never get old to me. Help us, Lord, to glory in the good news that you did not leave us in our sin. Judgment did not have the final word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the scriptures which show us who and what we are. Help us to walk worthy of that calling. In Jesus' name, amen.